This is a Defocus Media production. Hi, Dry Eye Divas. It's been a long time since we've gotten together. This is Amy Gallant Sullivan. I'm here with Dry Eye Diva of the West, Laura Perriman, ophthalmologist, Dry Eye Diva of the East, Leslie O'Dell, optometrist. Hi, Divas. Hello. How's it going? It's great to have you here, especially since it's July, which is Dry Eye Awareness Month. And it's a really great time to discuss how cosmetics usage can actually promote dry eye disease. And what better way to discuss how that's possible than by briefing our exciting opportunity of discussing this on the Hill. Yes, Dry Eye Divas were in Washington, D.C. In fact, we were there last year and this year. And Laura was actually in Washington, D.C. last year when we had the first opportunity to discuss Dry Eye Awareness Month. And she, she gave a poster a Dry Eye Diva poster uh, during the congressional briefing that addressed cosmetics usage in dry eye. Laura, would you like to explain your experience in D.C.? Yes. I had the incredible opportunity to go to D.C. last July during Dry Eye Awareness Month. And I have to say that it was one of my career highlights to be able to speak to members of Congress about ophthalmology, about optometry, about eye health, and about the incredible need for funding for additional science for NAI and NIH funding. So that was, to me, it felt like incredible advocacy on behalf of our patients that we do our very best for on a daily basis and left me with a great sense of hope that we will see more and more innovations, cures for things that were blinding before. It was uh, was a real bucket filler experience, I have to say. The specific part that I had during the, the meeting that we had and the people attended was I had a poster Uh, that the three of us had worked on together, talking about cosmetics dangers and its impact specifically to dry eye disease. Quite relevant, given that Dry Eye Disease Awareness Month is in fact July. So it was, again, it was an amazing experience. And I am so excited to hear how your experience was this year. And I hope it was just as fulfilling. Well, it was really neat because first of all, we were invited back and we were surrounded once again by really world-renowned eye care specialists and it it was such an honor to be there and it was really it was exciting to bring Leslie in and what was kind of amusing is when I introduced the congressional briefing I paused and I asked the audience a question I looked at everyone and I said what do an iPhone and a tube of mascara have in common everybody in the audience thought I was completely mad I'm sure so I hesitated for a bit and then I said well in fact they both promote dry eye disease (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, while we're not here to discuss how much time we spend on Tinder or Facebook and how the technology can impact our, our eye health, we can talk about how the cosmetics do. And what was neat about this year is we actually had a presentation about cosmetics usage and dry disease. And Leslie addressed the audience and people people were in complete disbelief. There were actually so many photographs being taken during her presentation. I'm sure lots of people videoed it. So Leslie, what, what did you talk about? Well, it was great to be there. And so thank, I was you know thankful for the opportunity. And Laura did tell me it was going to be a career highlight. And it, it definitely was. So I appreciate that a lot. So I just spoke about what we know, which isn't really all that much about cosmetic risks to the ocular surface um, and the need for us to learn a lot more about you know the potential risk from all the these industrial strength chemicals that are going into our product. But I do agree that there was a, a big response and I had some of the some of the senators, their staff came up to me afterwards really interested in the topics we had talked about. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that you know, we at least spent an year to get some more knowledge out there. And actually, it's interesting that you mentioned some of the senators because actually Dr. Scott Schachter visited with Senator Feinstein's staff and Senator Feinstein does currently have a a bill in Congress about cosmetic safety. And it's really interesting when you start realizing how many companies are behind this new bill because truthfully regulation on cosmetics hasn't been addressed or changed since what was it 1938 when the first regulations came out and not that we have any interest whatsoever in putting cosmetics in in the same category as pharmaceutical products but it's kind of interesting if you think about it just for a second because some of the ingredients in eye makeup and cosmetics and even personal hygiene products 
are similar ingredients that are found in pharmaceuticals. Take, for example, in glaucoma medication, there is an ingredient called benzoclonium chloride, which actually has um, a compromising effect on the eye. And Laura, can you explain a little bit how this preservative, which is used in glaucoma medication, is used? And actually, there was Harvard research recently that was put out about these types of preservatives as well as formaldehyde. So the benzoclonium chloride, the back, and formaldehyde, and how the concentrations in, say, glaucoma medication and the concentrations in cosmetics are very different. What was your thought on that research that just came out? Well, I was so happy to see that important paper looking directly at the cellular toxicity of these very common ingredients. Um, you know, there's it's a double-edged sword when you're talking about an eye medication. It does need to be preserved so that it doesn't become contaminated with fungus, bacteria, etc. However, BAK, the preservative, also directly damages your epithelial cells and your goblet cells. That's a problem if you have dry eye. Now, with respect to cosmetics, the BAK concentration concentration is several hundredfold higher than what you would find in ophthalmic prescription eye drops or over-the-counter eye drops. And so based on that paper, uh, it was a huge aha moment for me. I'm like, of course, this is why I see so much damage to the ocular surface with liquid eye makeup removers that have an undisclosed amount of BAK, yet based on the FDA labeling laws that say you have to list ingredients that are 1% or higher, and the fact that BAK is typically only about halfway down in the list of ingredients in very popular liquid eye makeup removers leads one to conclude that the concentration is extraordinarily high. And so clinically, I see that when I bring this to my patient's awareness and they are able to stop using makeup remover ingredients that have high loads of BAK, that in fact their dry eye disease does get better. So it's it's a lot of consumer education, inadequate disclosure of risks of common cosmetic products and ingredients, and we're starting to uncover it. And I find it really rewarding and powerful to spread the word of what we've discovered, the three of us together. And actually talking about pharmaceutical products and cosmetics, we also have to look at another trends in cosmetics and also OTC products, but the eyelash growth serum. I know we've all been discussing that a lot and how there's definitely a trend with long, luscious lashes and we know that we can go to our eye doctor and get a prescription for it, but that's okay because you're talking to your eye doctor and they know your conditions and your lifestyle choices. But if you can buy this product in a shopping mall or from your neighbor, could Laura, could you actually explain what the active medical ingredient is that and is inside the OTC eyelash growth serums and why we should be worried about this and how we can educate uh, our neighbors and our colleagues. And then also, Leslie, I'd, I'd love to hear from you because I know you know many people that sell these products. Yeah. So uh, sure, I'll take that that question. The active ingredient in over one third of over-the-counter non-prescription eyelash growth products contain a chemical called prostaglandins. Now you're not going to be able to read the ingredient list and recognize the word prostaglandin. So again, buyer beware, consumer beware. The these chemicals have organic chemistry, Franken chemical names. The main one that we see again and again in lash growth serums is something called isopropyl cloprostenate. Now that's a mouthful, but that is a synthetic prostaglandin. The challenge with prostaglandins is that we use them medically to treat glaucoma. It's a big class of medications we use to lower eye pressure for glaucoma patients. Now we also know that the incidence of meibomian gland dysfunction, which is a big word for plugged up oil glands in your eyelids, the incidence of that amongst glaucoma patients who do take a prostaglandin is about 91%. Conversely, patients who are on alternative classes of eye pressure lowering medications only run about 54%. That paper came out about two years ago. So the problem with over-the-counter prostaglandins is that 
you have a direct impact on your meibomian gland health. And that's just with respect to the synthetic prostaglandin. I'm not even talking about the additional insults from the EDTA preservative that are in those, from the formaldehyde donating preservatives that are hidden in those, the alcohols that are hidden in over-the-counter lash growth serums. The dangers are wide and varied and the prostaglandin is just one part of the story. Well, you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. And also I was speaking with Leslie the other day because she mentioned that she was talking to one of her friends whose daughter is a, a competitive dancer and she she's actually using fake eyelashes. So you have the OTC eyelash growth serum on the market for these long lashes, lashes but you also have the false eyelashes, which have a lot of chemicals in the glues, which is quite disconcerting because uh, very young children are also using these. So Leslie, could you explain what your friend said and what what you see with this eyelash growth trend in the clinic and also with the false eyelashes? So with um, the false eyelashes, the big concern is what chemicals are in the glue um, that they're adhering the lashes with. A lot of times it is formaldehyde, which we're finding is very damaging to um, the ocular surface and on a cellular level. So also inside, when you glue these lashes to the lid, you're to not clean them. So a lot of blepharitis will be seen and inflammation of the lid margin. But I was kind of shocked. I was giving a presentation um, to a local you know, group of optometrists. And afterwards, one of the doctors came up to me to, and told me of this trend in young dancers. And so I hadn't really thought about kids, you know, eight to 10 years old, having to have these false eyelashes glued for competition. Um, and even this woman said how for a few days after her daughter removes them that her lids are red and swollen, but she didn't really, you know, she probably thought in her doctor brain that it was an allergic reaction to something in the glue. But but it's interesting how we just accept that as a society. And, and what are we really, we're putting even these young girls at risk with these chemicals. Um, so I really was looking even at like subsets of patients. Another, another subset of patients that I came across was women that are into aquatics, whether it be um, competitive water skiing or swimming, oftentimes turn to a yet a different trend, which, which um, is permanent eyeliner um, and tattooing of the eyeliner so that they can have that makeup ready look when they're in water all the time. So it's interesting just to see how different patients we're treating and subtypes of people are, are doing different trends. But the big craze right now is with these over-the-counter growth serums. I see it with, you know, my mom friends, my neighbors. Definitely there is an obsession for long, lush lashes. I'm not quite sure where it started, um, but it's kind of like we we go deaf to what we're actually doing um, for the sake of beauty. Um, and so I think that we really do need to explore more what these synthetic prostaglandins are doing and educate women who are using over-the-counter products that it is, you know, the same as a prostaglandin analog with with class C indications and pregnant and nursing women should know that and use with caution. And, you know, my fear is just that they're not getting that messaging from, you know, their friend and neighbor that might be selling it to them. Laura, are you seeing a lot of trends also with the eyelashes in your clinic? And what do you tell your patients? Uh, yes, I do see some interesting eyelash trends in my clinic. The interesting thing about it is it's not uncommon to have a previously healthy asymptomatic patient come in complaining of dry eye symptoms. And it takes you putting the two together for them to realize that what they did to beautify themselves actually caused harm. So in my estimation, because I do see so much harm and damage from the eyelash extensions and the known alterations in the aerodynamic protective effects of the eyelashes, that I don't think they're beautiful at all. In fact, I think they look artificial and contrived. And frankly, we know that they're harmful. So I'm not a fan of the eyelash extensions or the 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 trend at all. Well, you know, I think we've actually covered some pretty scary and fascinating subjects tonight. And there is definitely a lot to learn. And there's definitely a lot to educate. Again, our colleagues, the, the doctors, the patients, everyone out there, both men and women, whether it be for the eyelash growth serums or what you wash your face with. So we definitely have a lot of a lot more conversations to have in front of us. And also to note, we now have Dry Eye Devo website where you can read about articles that we've published on this subject, cosmetics usage and dry disease. And there is a lot more coming. More conversations, more articles, more blog posts. Um, visit us at dryeyediva.com. Thank you very much. Divas, it was great talking to you. <laughs>